Hi, I'm Paul Roberts. This is Conscious Counseling 101, special edition today. I'm going to talk about my whole history, which you see most of it summarized right here in the things that I have here in my life. If you're nostalgic and analytical and you continue to remember your entire history, you will be able to not lose your way in life. And you'll be able to gain strength from every lesson you've learned and every lesson you still have to learn. This is one video I have not ever done before. And I realize because the fires are on their way here, or at least they were, we hope they won't because we have uh, historic winds of up to 80 mile an hour gusts right now. And the fires were east of us just the other day. So there's a very good chance that that was gonna spark our mountain chain here and possibly bring devastation over to us, possibly losing our house. So I would be talking to you next week if that happens or will happen. And this won't be here. So I thought, let's go ahead and do this. I don't want to value these things too much in the sense of their treasure or worth because there is none. I've got a safe right here. It's not even locked. I've got another safe over there. There's nothing in it. The most expensive thing I probably own, other than a car, is some cymbals on my drum set. If anybody was going to walk in and take something out, they'd probably be able to do that. It would be the best thing they could do if they wanted to pawn them. That's not worth hardly anything. Everything that I place value on in this world isn't about value of this world. It's about value of perspective. <laughs> surprise, surprise, right? That's what I always talk about in Conscious Counseling 101. So today we're going to talk about how I use these things and how I can help maybe teach you to use these things. Most of the people that are around me, in my family and friends and people that I know, and especially in this area of the world, because I go to open houses a lot, I see what, you know, what people live like. A lot of people don't have a lot of stuff. A lot of people have a lot of stuff. But I wonder whether or not that stuff is just so they can work in the world on a day-to-day -day basis. I spend my life by myself in a workshop, in an office, in a cave, behind the video, whatever. The things that I have don't have the normal value that other people would need for their life. They only have value in helping me to become everything that I can be. And I'm going to show you how I do that today. It's one of the ways, anyway. There's a lot of other ways. So I'm going to walk down memory lane. A real fast tour. If I was to go through everything that I have here, everything that's come through my fingers, it would take me months of videos. But we're not going to do that. What we're going to do today is we're going to do a total generic summary of what is here and what other things I have lying in other areas and why they're there and why I keep them. There are only a few items in my history that I've ever parted with. A few items that I was foolish as a young child to get rid of, and maybe some toys of the children's that I used in order to make money to buy them more toys because I wanted them to have a diverse world. We worked at home and our children were at home with us and they needed to be busy so we could be busy. Also cars, you gotta get rid of cars and motorcycles and things like that and other houses because you have to buy another car, another house. You gotta keep things up if you move to a different location. Everything I do, I make from the things that come through my hands. I'm an independent entrepreneur, and I have been for about 25 years. Before that, I was still a renaissance man, but I was using my services to work for the man. And the best man I could think of was the movie industry. I love the movie industry. And before that, uh, uh, just a regular guy that uh, let me do illustration for him. And before that, A&P. They were a top Fortune 100 company at the time and they had plans to dominate the supermarket chain. And I was one of the two leading illustrators for that chain for about a year. And I said, this is not for me. I had to wear a tie to work every day. I had to commute an hour and an hour back. I said, no, no, no. So I pulled the rug out from underneath myself and I started doing freelance. And I, I just barely made enough to make the, our expenses while my wife was finishing up college. And then we both got jobs. She got a job in an advertising agency in Baltimore. I got a job in an illustration studio in Baltimore. We did that for a short while, just enough time to save up just a little bit of money and move back home where our family and friends were in Orlando. And so we did that. All this stuff that you see here didn't necessarily exist at that time, but most of it did. And I've added to it. And I'll explain the difference between what existed from the beginning what the sources were and what was added. And I'm going to do it for the purposes, not of showing off what I have, but of showing off what I do with what I have. What I do with what I have is remember who I am and where I've been and what that means and what I've learned and what I've gained and what I can share with others. 
And this is one of the tools that I use in Conscious Counseling 101. I'm analytical. I'm always reconsidering the whole thing. I have the firm links to various things in my life that help me become who I am. And I use those links every day. I want you to know why I'm doing this. And if you proceed with me, if you know me or you want to know more about me and where my thoughts come from, this is the video for you. I'm never going to cover it all, okay? This is the basic place where I sit in my office right here, okay? I'm surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven, eight, eight treasure chests full of interesting things. This one right here has just about every video I ever shot in college inside of it. This one here has my children's memorabilia. There's one that I got from my Uncle Harry back there, and that's got all my things up until the point of college stored in it. Memories from my history as a child. I have almost every drawing and piece of artwork that I've ever done stored in other places. I did take, at one point, a portfolio that was this thick, and I just didn't have room while I was in college in my apartment. And I probably shouldn't have done this, but, and I should have taken pictures like I'm doing now, but I didn't. All the work that I did in college, all the things that I did to teach myself about analytical thinking, color theory, drawing, everything you can think about art, art theory, the whole portfolio of all the work that I did, I threw out one morning, and I still remember it as vividly as yesterday, into a garbage truck and watched them, there it went. I don't know why I did that. I think it's because I always thought a portfolio needs to be carried in your hand, it needs to be thin. And I said, how am I going to carry all this throughout my life? But like I say, that only helped me become what I am today. So there were tools that were used and put back in the toolbox. I would like to have those things today, but to tell you the truth, I remember a lot of them. And I incorporate them. So I'm not going to put that in this video because I can't. Oh, where do I start? Let's start from the beginning. When I was just a young child, my mother and father had a friend who was wealthy in Toledo, Ohio, I think, or Cincinnati or Cleveland. We lived in Michigan. And they gave me this small rocking chair as a child. So that's one of my first things that I ever used and, and benefited from. Oh gosh, how am I gonna do this? Uh, let's talk about the value of family. My grandfather was a builder. My Uncle Harry that gave me this chest was a builder. My uncle was a builder. My father was an architect. They all lived in Michigan, and I went to their job sites and observed what they do. I went to my grandfather's shop and observed how he made things. Well, guess what? I've made my living for the past 25 years or so by making things. This is my grandmother's desk. This came from Parkway Heights Free Methodist Church and the Fellowship Hall. Somehow, they were getting rid of things. They needed to make room for other things, more tables or whatever, and they gave it to her. Well, when my grandmother was getting older, she asked, what would you like from me after I pass on? What would you like to remember me by? And I said, well, I'd like that desk. It was a no contest, boom, right? Just like that. And the little planter underneath it that's like one of those old jugs for water or whatnot, or wine or whatever you put in there, had a plant in it at the time that's since died. But the reason why I wanted this was I played in her dining room on the floor while the kitchen was right next door by it as a child. So I remembered the shape and size and I wanted to remember that playtime whenever I was at her house. Now that's very important. And what's inside this and what's on top of it? From my other grandmother, my grandmother Collie. Now I never knew my real grandfather because he was abusive and he was um, not there by the time I came up. But uh, I knew my other grandfather and he took care of me really well. We had some nice times together. He taught me how to creatively play. And <laughs> we'd play cowboys and Indians. He died when I was young. And he was already having heart and strength issues at that time. And so he would be the Indian sitting on the mound, the chief, not having to do anything. And I would go run around the yard and do all these different things. And I'd say, come on, come and, come and do these things with me. Well, he couldn't. He didn't have the energy or the strength. I didn't understand that, but I, at least he was playing. He was there. He was Indian chief. We'd go out and we'd direct traffic. 
Oh gosh, I'm getting too far away from the stuff already. <laughs> but I guess it's more important than the stuff itself, telling why it's important. We'd go out and direct traffic. He had one of those crossing guard belts, and I put it on, and I want to go out in the street, but I can't go in the street. So he'd go out in the street with me while I had this crossing guard belt on. I felt like all that. And we'd go out there, and we're getting ready to direct traffic. Whenever a car came, he'd pick me up and take me over to the side of the road and say, but Grandpa, after a while, I said, but Grandpa, that's when we need to be there the most, when the cars are coming, so that we can direct them. <laughs> Little did I know that you can't just be a traffic director by putting on a traffic director's belt. <laughs> but he taught me how to play creatively. He gave in to the things that, that I wanted to do in the best way he knew how. I lost him at an early age. And the age when I lost him was the age of the very day I learned out what I figured out. I didn't figure out. I was told what death was and I found out what death was. The very day that I lost him, I have uh, many of his canes back here in, these, in this uh, umbrella holder that belonged to my grandmother, Roberts. So I have my grandfather, Collie's canes in here, a bunch of them. And also Mr. Woods, who was also, later in life, my grandmother got together with Mr. Woods, way later in life, uh, for the retirement years, and some of his are in there as well. Uh, maybe I'll start over here since I've talked about the desk. That was filled with my grandmother's things, my other grandmother's. So my grandmother gave me the desk, Uncle Harry gave me the chest. The chest is filled with my own personal items. The desk is filled with my other grandmother's items. And the bottom two drawers are filled with every single thing that my children ever handed me that would fit in those drawers. Behind me, in another room, I have boxes and boxes and boxes of all their toys. Why? I get to take a picture of it and say, hey, remember these toys? Well, first off, you needed an acre to spread the, <laughs> spread the toys out. You couldn't really take a picture of them. Here we have 30 decent sized bins filled with mostly children's possessions. One day, they may care about these things and use them for the value of remembering their childhood like I do. Because I want to do unto them as I would want it done unto me, I must honor them in case that is the case so that they have that opportunity that they might not foresee now. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I care about this. One day I'm hoping that they'll look at them again and they'll gain even more of their history. I wish I had the toys I had when I was a child. I have very little of what was left. We moved from Michigan to Florida and I was allowed to take a couple boxes of things. I, I took whatever I could. I took my GI Joes, you know, whatever I thought was important. I didn't have a lot of stuff at that time anyway. They were my action-adventure toys that helped me to imagine what I'd be if I was an adventurer. In some ways, I am an adventurer. In some ways, my child, Max, in some ways, is an adventurer. He likes to do that. My other daughter's more adventuring into movies and uh, things like that, and stage and theater and drama. And I think it's because that's just what she took to. She saw that's how you adventure, that's how you're creative. My son said exploring new places and learning about the things and having an education, all about that is what he's into. So this was all passed on. So these things here, I want to just tell a brief story about this Marvel the Mustang, my little horse. This wasn't kept since my childhood. I lost this. One day when I was at my uncle's house, and this is my other uncle, not the one that's a builder, I came up to me with my mother and said, uh, my mother said, your uncle Jack would like to keep your Marvel the Mustang horse for a few days, or uh, a couple of days. And I said, well, what's a couple of days? And, and like two? And said, no, more like a week. I thought, and I said, I thought a couple of days was two. No, a couple of days is more like a week. Well, we only saw him like a couple times a year. I should have just said, no, you don't have the ability to do that. But hey, I'm, they're my caregivers. I have to do what they say. So I went ahead and uh, gave it to them. I never got it back. When I became older, I re-bought one of the Marvel and Mustangs so that I would have those memories. Never played with it, just rebought it. That's how important it was. It doesn't make the sound anymore. When I first went to Texas with my son after he was born, you know, I grew up with the Lone Ranger and Cowboys. I got the Clayton Moore's Lone Ranger safe right over there. He owned that safe, it was given to me by his daughter. I grew up with Cowboys and Indians. So that means a lot to have that safe in my possession, even though there's nothing in it, it's not locked. When I took my son 
to Texas for the first time, he was just a little boy. And I got him a little hat. His hat is stored. But I bought myself a hat. First time I'd ever been to Texas. For my cousin, Renee's, her, her father was the builder, marriage. And I took him to a cowboy ranch, the only one I could find. I thought, when you're in Texas, that's where the cowboys are, right? <laughs> really hard to find the cowboys at the time. But that's, that's the hat that I got when I took him to that ranch. And he was just a baby in my arms. I have a tumbleweed up here from New Mexico or Arizona. First tumbleweed I ever saw when we crossed the country for the first time. I grabbed it. And it's still there. It's getting a lot, a lot, a lot smaller now. <laughs> I had uh, these bows and arrows when I was a child. I used to go to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. That's where my mom and dad would take us. I don't have mine. They all broke because I used them like crazy. But I kept one that the children had, just to remember. I since then can't see it, but when, it, when I got older, I got a, a big bow and arrow. You know, a real bow and arrow, so that I could, you know, think like those cowboys and Indians did. Just went. My dad took me to the target range. It was some of the best times we ever spent with my father, other than throwing the baseball around. My dad was very shy, <clears throat> and um, even within our family, he was very quiet. But I had a lot of times with my mother and father going to Gatlinburg, and they introduced this, this idea of a concept of a place far away that was different than our own. And I enjoyed being there. And I became creative even more so when I was there. I became a cowboy, I became an Indian. I became different things that I imagined at home but couldn't get as close to. I was in the real world there. I rode my first horse. And I got on the horse and um, I was just a little baby. Not a baby. I mean, I, was, I could climb up there, I guess. Maybe a little bit of help. Maybe, uh, oh gosh, I'd say five or six maybe. And I knew how to make it go. So I, right away when I got there, I did just what they did on the uh, westerns. I made it go. And they had to run after me and go get it real quick. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, oh, here's a picture of Lone Ranger right here. Uh, Lone Ranger and Tonto. My mom had gotten me this. I wasn't very happy with her. I started out this video with the rocking chair that I received as a child that I rocked in, but she had gotten rid of a rocking chair that was an antique that I was rocked in as a child. She had a relationship with a store at the time, and she gave me this, which is fine. It transferred. We'll talk about more, more about transfers. Because through the transfer, you can remember the history. It was nice of her because she knew I lived next to the Lone Ranger's daughter, and she thought that would be meaningful. So that's fine. There it is. Yes, it is meaningful. I'd like to still have the uh, rocker, but hey, you can't, can't have control over everything in the world, right? You just can't. I used to go to Gatlinburg, and one of the things I'd do is I'd go to little rock stores. I'd go and, and get little uh, carved rocks. This is a carved piece of wood of a bear. I've had that my whole life, ever since I was maybe four or five. And here I have, when I went as an adult and climbed to the top of one of the highest mountains in the Smoky Mountains National Park, I have a top piece of rock that was taken off one of the top peaks. So this was one of the most top parts from Chimney Tops, and I set my bear on that. And of course, you're not supposed to take anything out of the park, but that was so long ago, I didn't even know that. This is my grandfather's golf trophy. Very important. More important than any trophy that I've earned, because it reminds me of how I got to where I am now. What I am now is transient, it's passing away. It's going through time. But this was more important as a foundational stone to make me more aware of who I am as I'm doing it. Because everything that I achieve is the award, not the award itself, but what I do and how I pass it on to others is the award. So this was required to get me to where I am. It's very important that I realize that. And I'd like, if you're watching this, that some of you might start thinking about the things in your life and how they may be like that. This is one of the tools that Conscious Counseling 101 can offer to people if they find me. And I hope that they listen to these things and maybe they'll get something out of it. Maybe it will change their life position or perspective. They'll be more aware of what's around them. I call that heightened conscious awareness. Nice little clay figures from Epcot Center. I bought my wife a bonsai tree. And these are under there, so delicately done, so inexpensive back then early 90s, I guess when we moved to Florida again after Baltimore. Well, the bonsai tree, we tried our hardest, but we just couldn't keep it going. But they're still there. That's a memory of that. <laughs> I'm going out of order. I don't know. I'm never going to get through this stuff um, because I've already talked about it generally. I'm just going to go through a few things. I went on a cruise with my children and I went up on the stage, had to do one of those stupid little game things and make a fool out of myself. But 
This was the prize I won. Holland America, golf balls and tees. But I don't care. I'm never going to open. I'm never going to play golf. I only remember the memory. That I was able to go up there and make a memory for them. And have a memory for me. That's all that matters. Well, this sitting here, that's what matters about it. That's all. The things don't matter. Now, here's something I purchased. I purchased a film reel trailer of Rob Roy. The values and the honor that that story taught to me as a younger person. Uh, I'm very movie inclined. I'm very audibly and visually sensitive as an artist. So this spoke to me. I wouldn't have read the book, even though the book, I could have gotten that out of it maybe, but I got it out of it the way I did. I got this. I never watched it. It reminds me that I have a piece of actual movie trailer. It reminds me of that, that a movie theater might play to show what's coming up. Okay, so I only need one of those. Just one. There's no value in it. Um, I'll just go ahead and go off the top of the, a few of these things. Uh, these are uh, the uh, earthworks, Yorktown. They were able to make a dent in the British Army because they had taken vines and things and made these and, and filled them up with earth so the bullets and the cannonballs wouldn't get to them as easily. My children made those when we went to the uh, visitor center on our colonial trip. Very important. You know, like I'll, I'll take a rock and I'll say, okay, that rock's got black sharpie marker on the bottom of it. It says Anna Sweet 16. I made her an Anna Sweet 16 sign in rocks for her Sweet 16 beach birthday party. Took one of them home. This is a drum, not a very good drum, but an older drum. Um, I'm a drummer. I was out having a nice day in the country in Mount Dora with my wife, and I symbolically uh, memorized it with this piece. I got photographs of it. I've got photographs of it. I don't need a piece. For some reason, photographs get put away in dusty old books or on the internet or on your computer somewhere. You never look at them. Or you surround yourself with things and they're there all the time. Here's something I recently acquired. We were uh, doing some, uh, some work looking for uh, various snakes and amphibians and things like that after a big rain had given the um, Topanga Canyon a lot of wash down in the creek. And as we were looking for the best places to go, uh, we were going along the roadside, and people, you wouldn't believe how much trash people throw out of their car. And the best way to find out what kind of trash people throw out of the car is to go somewhere where it's not flat and they just can't pick it up on a regular basis. Somewhere it goes down the canyon. No one's ever gonna pick it up. So anything that doesn't deteriorate will can be picked up. There's a piece of junk trinket that somebody received, somebody didn't want it, they threw it out. But I kept this, why? There's no value in it. It's to remember that day when we found that chicken and saved that chicken's life and took it to somebody that wanted a chicken rather than just leaving it down there because it got washed down the it got washed down the creek. So that's what that is. Okay. Oh, the Constitution of the United States. You know, I got a Declaration of Independence up over there. Very important things. Every book that I've ever purchased or owned is right down here. I don't read books, but I do have some that came to my possession. Um, I'll tell you which one is the most important one in a moment here. Um, the movies that I first started working on when I came down to Florida. Even Angels Fall with Engelbert Humperdinck and Morgan Fairchild. Cop and a Half with Burt Reynolds. Directed by Henry Winkler, The Fonz. John Ritter, Problem Child 2. Wow, that was awesome. Brian Levant gave me a lot of good chances there. Maria Queso, who uh, was the uh, production designer for Terminator, the first Terminator. I worked with her. Great opportunity. That helped me a lot. I met some people. I wish I was still in contact with them, but I'm just not for some reason. I'm trying to get in contact with some of them. They're hard to reach. They don't, they don't, they, you know, you ever heard those that can do, those that can't teach? Well, there's something to that. If you're busy, that's what you're doing. You're not doing anything else. You're just doing that. And you're not into all these other things about like getting in touch with people. You really kind of lose your way a little bit if you're not careful. This is one of the things, David and John, you don't understand. <laughs> you didn't understand then, you probably won't understand now. The reason why I do all this costuming stuff is because I went to my wife and I said, I'd like to buy this $1,500 Batman costume. There was no money. We didn't ever have any money. We were all, almost always month to month. <clears throat> and I said, well, all right, I'm not going to make a Batman costume instead, you know, like the Grinch. If I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. Well, what I had done all these years is make costumes. Not the kind I wanted to, but it just so happened 
that on our honeymoon, we walked into the Chinese theater, and on the screen was this huge bat symbol. And I said, oh my gosh, they're going to make Batman again. I was a huge Bat Adam West fan when I was younger. It just so happened that Hollywood, at that time, was using molds and latex and things like that and sculpting to make a suit for the modern day hero. Supposedly it was bulletproof or whatever. And so it just so happened that my friends, who were also in my art school and high school, um, they went and instead of going to college, they started their little shops there and they started working for the industry and making things like this because they wanted to, to go and get into the industry. And so I said, you know what, I want to make a Batman costume. I didn't know how to sew or anything. Show me what you know. And they, they helped me to make a head bust and then showed me how to sculpt something on there. I already knew how to sculpt because I was an artist. But then they showed me how to make a mold of it and everything was history from then. But this is why this is important. When I finally got the first bat suit that I first wanted, I was so excited because I had walked this long distant walk of I'd say 20 years. And I wanted to go back to my brothers that I had so much fun filming with and having a good time playing as children that led me on my career path into the movies and television and into prop building and all the things that had happened. And I said, help me share this with you. I'm going to go for what I originally had and use it with you. And we're going to reenact those fun days we had when I was a child. We're going to go in the Dragon Con Parade, which I normally do because they're in Atlanta. That's, you know, works out. I wore this in the Dragon Con parade one time, Rick O'Connell uh, outfit that I made. And we're going to be two thugs wearing these little beanie caps and a black shirt that says Thug 1 and Thug 2 on it. And I'm going to be Batman. And we're going to have this fight scene and have all this stuff to, for people to watch. Because if you've ever seen the Dragon Con parade, one of the things you notice is everybody just walks down the street. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you are, superhero, whatever. That's what they do. Well... There's just a dysfunction in my family where we don't understand each other. I went off and became this artist and this analytical thinker and this, but still tied to realities. I mean, I'm describing here. My world is too, too foreign for them to understand. I think David understands it a little bit and likes to be a part of it, but John just doesn't at all. He used to be so close to me. We play drums, we do all kinds of things. I'm trying to reach out to him now. and I don't know, maybe I'm getting to him, but he's not letting me know I am. So they wouldn't, couldn't, they just descended into dips of catastrophe uh, when I asked something of them. I guess they thought, oh, I've got to do something good for my brother. That's my euphemistic way of looking at it. And I'll never measure up. No, <laughs> just being there is what's good. Doesn't matter what it is. I tried to explain that to them, but they just wouldn't hear it. So one of my brother's friends stepped up and wore one of the thug caps. And he was a thug. And instead of having elaborate fight scenes and whatnot of what we used to do when we were pretending to be the $6 million man and filming things and superheroes and stuff and doing Poseidon Paul and Indiana Dave and whatnot and Jumpin' John, we basically were going to go around and just like look like we're doing stuff. I'm going to go BAM! You know, and stuff like that. I'm going to fall over and stuff and we're going to have somebody holding a sign that says BAM or maybe some sound effects. I don't know. Well, they didn't participate. Gosh, I'm getting way off this. I'm sorry, guys. So I went around with this inflatable balloon, this inflatable beach ball, painted black with a little fuse on it, as the Batman from the movie that says, I've got a bomb, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb, you know, running all over the place. It was something to do instead, and every once in a while I'd go over to my thug and he'd hit me and I'd go, bam, and he'd put up the bam sign. Well, at that particular year we did really well, and we got a lot of attention, and it went over well. And you know, if they would just run around with me, uh, it would have worked really well too. But it uh, wasn't meant to be. Okay, getting back to this stuff. I just want to show you. I've got the stuff sitting up there. That's how valuable it is. That's how valuable it is. Okay, but I've got uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I got eleven hearts out of coquille and rock that my daughter has found. She would find a heart everywhere we go. So important to have those there. From martial arts, the first two boards that my wife and I ever broke signed by all the people in our school. My uh, college professor sent me this bookend of Superman holding up the books for a shelf or whatever. I don't really do books, but the idea that he realizes that I'm into this stuff is meaningful, so I put it there next to his clock that he gave us. Down here we have a cake saver. My mom and dad had this back in the 70s. And every very perishable thing that my children have given me that did not go in the desk, it just somehow ended up in there for some reason. 
is in the cake saver. And a special book down in there too. Heart made out of a pipe cleaner. Look how valuable that is. A heart made out of a pipe cleaner for my girl that finds hearts. I found a smiley face the other day and she found a heart 10 seconds after that. <laughs> I thought I was gonna beat her for once. Nope. Oh, and then of course, <clears throat> I had a Gran Torino. I wanted to paint it like Starsky and Hutch, but it was the wrong year model. And I said, ah, it's starting to have problems with it. So I said, let's get another, let's get another car that I can paint like something that's interesting. I said, oh, I know, the Dukes of Hazard. Let's get the car that the Dukes of Hazard has. I need a new car anyway. They're inexpensive. Let's do it. So I did. My friend and I started looking. <clears throat> we found a 69 Dodge Charger and we grabbed it. Oh, I almost forgot this. Don't want to forget this. This is a little putting tee that my grandfather had and uh, I would play with it. He got it for golf, but it had this neat little thing. And when you're a child, you can't find a putter that you can use. Well, this one extends. It's like for an office. You can make it any, any extension you want. So I was all, always able to putt with this as a child and use this as a toy because they didn't have a lot of toys. So that, that's uh, one of his items I have there next to his, or it was next to his uh, trophy. Now it's <clears throat> nearby his trophy. I've got the world, the world adventurer things. It all started, I didn't go searching the world. I did my searching through movies. I've done a lot of exploring of America, been in almost every state. I've taken my children on many tours across the United States. But it all started here with asking for this spear, this Maasai spear right here. By the way, this is my grandmother's painting. Used to always hang up in her uh, house. Now, my wife was going on safari in Africa. I wasn't interested in animals like her and my son. Um, I went to the zoo events with her and, and talked about it and stuff like that. But I wasn't going to go. We didn't have enough money anyway. I uh, needed something else. I think the, uh, the Africa trip, instead of going there, I bought my first really good drum set. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, she was going there. And I said, well, could you bring back a, uh, an actual item from one of the people over there? Like a weapon type thing, you know. And she did. <clears throat> so that spear was the first thing. She went up right to a Maasai warrior and said, can I buy that from you? She grabbed it and gave him the money. And he was happy to sell it because they can make another one. That's very meaningful because she was bold. She went touring. She had an adventurous spirit that I must have admired because when I got together with her, I didn't look at her as an adventurer. I think the adventurer spirit had to do with animals, so that's why I didn't notice it. Um, but she ended up being an adventurer. She brought me back bows and arrows, clubs, uh, nice uh, African knife. You know, I've got a quiver here. <clears throat> I should talk about things on my desk here. They're most important uh, right in front of me all the time. Uh, props from the Mummy movie. These are the shackles from when uh, Brandon Fraser is going to be hung. A lot of prisoners are holding those up. This is a Bible that I use for my own studies, but it was bought at a garage sale. This was very similar to the one in Indiana Jones, and I grabbed it. That was Raiders of the Lost Ark. <sighs> I had always been looking for a Holy Grail. This is the closest I could come. The False Grail, right? This is the closest I could come. It's not painted. It was supposedly the, the grail that uh, was used for the model. It's still got the indications on there uh, that was made for the Lucasfilm book where they had to represent one and they didn't have it to use for a photograph. So they had to make it. So I grabbed that. I'm not even going to paint it. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Because the whole idea is just to have a few things like that from your history. Uh, this is a Buffy the Vampire uh, prop stake. I don't know much about it, but I helped my friend move in and out of the storage facility. Well, we were in between houses. I was hoping he would get a good start on life, you know, and he, I guess he gave that to me as a thank you. This is the one where Jonathan on the mummy, the actual prop, where he was uh, hitting at something on the ceiling and, and eventually, was it Jonathan? Maybe it wasn't. I think it was, no, Jonathan was using it for golf. Gosh, I gotta watch that movie again. It's been at least, at least five years. My son was afraid of it when he was a child, so we don't watch it very often. Uh, I guess it was uh, maybe Brendan Fraser was hitting the ceiling and then the sarcophagus fell down. That's the actual prop. So I have a few things like that. And the reason why I have those things is because my movie experience has been very close to me. And so I gain some of those types of things whenever I have an opportunity. So I can surround that closeness in the physicality of the world. Like for instance, I have an entire weapons case here from The Mummy 2. This is the exact weapons case in the trunk of the car where they get out and they decide, what do you prefer, the Thompson, whatever, whatever. And they both grab one out of it. This is the exact weapons case. And I've got most of the weapons there. I've got, uh, 
Well, they're not exact, but I do have the label. I've got a, a, one of these things that uh, I think he, uh, the guy held when he climbed up the ladder in one of the first scenes in The Mummy 2. Uh, a knife uh, like that. It's probably just one of the prop knives. So various things like Zorro costume and whip. I've got an Indiana Jones costume and actual whip. One time my wife went on a cruise with my um, brother-in-law and sister-in-law and it really wasn't a cruise for us because we had Max. He was just a baby and I played for that whole week with him. I played, played, played every single day. Played Hot Wheel cars, did everything we could do. The fact that she went on the cruise allowed me to say this is the most expensive item I've ever purchased. A real Indiana Jones whip from the person that made the Indiana Jones whip. It's the most outrageously expensive thing I've ever purchased in my life. So <laughs> it was the missing piece. But since then, I've way more than that made up for it by I needed a gun from a holster that you could take to conventions, and apparently other people did too. So other people have come to me and said, Can you make me one of those? Way more than paid for that. What do they say? If you help enough others get what they want, eventually you'll get what you want. I wanted to show you these things for what they're worth. Hopefully some of you are getting some things out of these. I don't know what you're going to get. These are the original chains right here from the end of the Mummy movie that Brendan Fraser took and cut Rachel Weiss off of that sacrifice table. And this was one of the stunt swords that he used to do it. It took me 10 years to find this. I paid for that by making a replica. You could say, well, I didn't make a replica of this. So how did I pay for this? The actual Mummy. Uh, rifle of the soldiers and things like that, of uh, the people that were, that were going up against. This is, <clears throat> this is one of the soldiers. And so you say, well, you didn't pay for that. How do you pay for that? There are a few items that I have purchased, like this, that I can't pay for by making it. Let's talk about that. This was my experiment to go in larger into the world of costuming. I eventually returned back to the latex. So this was part of my experiment. I started to make the props as if I was on the movie, like I used to be in the movies, but I'd make them for just me. Now you can't take a holster like this and try to make it cost effectively if you're not a holster maker. So right away I realized doing this kind of work was like art for art's sake, they said in art school. You do it for yourself. I realized that this was just for myself. There were a few things I did while I was in that phase of my life, that helped me become a larger costumer in the eyes of my costuming public. And in that way, I view them as paying for themselves. Also, there are a few things that do have some worth. Like, say I was going to sell this again. One day I could. Say I wanted to sell these again. Maybe one day I could. Not for a lot of money. But I think they would retain their value because they're screen used. A lot of it's been made back. In fact, the entire thing and plus some has been made back and just a few of the items that I've made from the props. I'll call that a wash. But why am I saying this? Because I don't recommend that you go out and purchase things. A lot of my things are given and nostalgic things from my family, both extended and close, with the rare exception of a few items as I was explaining Oh, let me, let me finish on that explanation. So I, I, I did this for a period of time thinking maybe I could make props from these things. I did sell one of the other holsters that I made. I made a prototype, which is not correct, and then I made this, and then I stopped. Other people asked for it. I did make an entire weapons case one time that I sold for probably almost the cost of every single item that I've purchased. So there, just in that one item, I made all that back. Not for my own creativity and whatnot. But I didn't go down that road. Why? Because you can't do it enough to justify the learning curve and the efficiency curve. So it's art for art's sake. You only do it for what you can give yourself. So that's part of that. We'll talk about the drum set in a minute. Let's talk about the typewriter. Everything on my desk here is supposed to be the idea. is supposed to be Nana Jones' office. Adventurer's office. Here's one that's a real thing. When I went to Alaska, I went to a, a uh, secondhand shop, and I knew they had to have a prospector's pan because they're not prospecting anymore, but they had to have been made out of material that was durable. I said, do you have one? They gave me this little tiny thing. I go, no, 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 no. I want a real, real prospector's pan. They go, I just had one that just came in. Went in the back, got it, I grabbed it. No value there. It didn't cost hardly anything. I needed a souvenir from the trip. Got it. Filled it with rocks from a creek and just say, well, that's one of my, what, Maybe it would have had once I sifted the water out of it. <laughs> so that's what that is. I've got various things like an actual older compass. 
When I go on adventures, I try to find something from an item. When I went to Grand Cayman, I said, you know what I don't have? I don't have, a, don't have an antique telescope. Uh, I figured Indiana Jones would have one of these on his desk. I was like, gee, I really use it sometimes. It's really dusty right now. Um, this is actually a set of binoculars given to me while I was lifeguarding, watching the beaches for an entire summer from Mr. Woods. And he gave that to me and I used that, but it's, it's made out of leather, the case. So everything I have here is kind of of the period. You know, then I do have props where I went on a cruise and I said, what would a pirate have? This is just a, a cheap replica prop. So I have spent money on things like that, but I call that like a cruise type of a thing, a souvenir, a lowly souvenir. Like I went to Dollywood in Tennessee and I was working on my cabin at the time. I had a leather cap bought from there. I thought, well, there you go. That's something that those kinds of people would buy. And we're talking over 30 years worth of time just to obtain these few props that you call souvenirs, really. This one here I get for free. I had to do something for somebody. It's a, it's a 3D printed grappling gun from Batman. I've had junkier ones, but this one's nicer. Um, but this is what I do. Let me just show you these two pieces. This is the most valuable thing. People were bringing back liquors and gold necklaces and watches and things like this from the islands. I was bringing back a piece of rotted out driftwood of bamboo. That was the greatest treasure I could find on that trip. But this is my favorite thing I ever found uh, that was uh, on those trips. Piece of really heavy rope. I don't know why they have it, just a small piece like that. Maybe it was just a scrap. I uh, duct taped the ends to keep it together. I thought that was cool. Little things you find on the beach, another piece of rope. It's so cool, something that, that's left on the beach floating around the ocean and then you grab it. You can't buy that in the store. These things look so cool, what the ocean does to things. So I like to have things like that around. It gives me the idea of what things feel like that are primitive. I went to a garage sale with my friend. And my friend, he, he's got so much stuff, he's got a whole store here. He, can't, he loves it just like I do, but he can't use the stuff because it's out of his reach. He wants me to bring him, help bring it back to his house, which I will do, but even when it's there, it's gonna take up all his rooms and it's gonna be all in boxes and he'll only be able to use it knowing that it's there, you know, looking at it occasionally, or maybe he'll take one of the models he does and he'll paint it. But I went to a garage sale with him and I got this ship's wheel. I thought it was cool to get that because it's made the way they really make it out of wood. You know, inexpensive, nobody else wants it, so it's a value. You know, you can get it really cheaply. Uh, this is one I don't think I've talked about yet. This is the Book of the Dead. I spent probably 10 years looking for that, just like with the sword. This is a stunt used Book of the Dead. Screen used, possibly, but if it was, it was just one they used for carrying. Um, it doesn't open, but it's the actual thing. There's people online now that make them, replicas, this is an actual one. So that's important to me, because why do I like the mummy? <laughs> I should talk about that. Why do I like the mummy? I like the mummy because the same reason I like Adam West Batman. It's got that same level of adventure hero and camp. So it, it fits the exact vein of Batman, for me but in a different era of time and in a different time of my life. Plus, I was costuming then. I was so tired of just always doing the Batman costume because it was so hot, so cumbersome. This is nice and light and airy. You walk around like a regular person, except you got the guns. But it's only for a convention, so it doesn't really matter because they know that uh, they're just plastic. I mean, they look real. I guess you could put a little tip on there or just don't take them out. Here we have, right here, one of my neighbor's telephones. She fell and broke her hip, had to go to assisted living in Colorado. We, have, we ended up buying her house. And some important things happened in the buying of the house. Um, but I always wanted to have a bat phone. And I'm going to call this the bat phone. It's not red, but it's the same type of thing as a bat phone. It's her phone. Still got the number on it. Same thing here. Oh. I've only ever been to one football game and only ever been to one baseball game. My dad took me to see the Detroit Tigers. Man, I gotta wash this off. Woo, that's dusty. The Detroit Tigers, when I was just a child. Remember that game? A little fuzzier than when he took me to see the Buccaneers. I remember that game. I've been married for 30 years. This is the 30 year anniversary. Have a sip of coffee here. 
It's cold. I've been talking too long. I know I gotta wrap this up. I want to do this way quicker than this. I don't think I'm gonna be able to edit very much out, and I'm not gonna be able to finish it. So I'm gonna wrap it up. I've got to. Anyway, let's do this. Katie's Carmel by the Sea. This is where we sat on our honeymoon 30 years ago. I don't use it very often because I've broken the other one. I still have it up in the cupboard in broken form. And I worry about breaking that. I'll never get rid of it, but I may break it. Oh, we were talking before and I got off track here. Let's get back on. I have here my robot that I created in art school. A biomorphic abstraction was this assignment. And I created, out of my plaster repair, I created something here um, that was a biomorphic abstraction. And I got an A-plus in that class. I was so into it. Never get a chance to express myself in this way before. So freely. I got done with that assignment as long as it took. And I did this other assignment. Didn't even have to do it. Same exact assignment. I did it twice. No wonder I got an A-plus. <laughs> I did the best I could. Found objects. Oh, this makes something special. Oh gosh, I could talk about this for a while too. Uh, this is something that's really important too because what we did was we searched, we searched and searched and searched the train yards and different things like that just for fun, walking around Baltimore, finding out what junk we could find. But I also took things from my personal life as found objects that could become part of this particular one. This one here is a siren or a horn that I had in my car. Um, I never got the actual air horn for the General Lee. Uh, but this one made lots of sounds and you could talk through it too. But it broke and I tried to get it fixed and it broke again. But it's a memory from the past. We have wires and different things that I have had in my collection because I used to, I don't know what I thought, I guess I used to use, you know, Radio Shack was big back then. I thought if I had my own wires I could use my, my own things. I found an overhead projector for the head and for the hand. This is actually a uh, thing I used to use for a tweeter in my car. Um, various things like this. Oh, this is one of my original watches when I was in junior high school. Now, I have a, one of my first watches that was given to me in my chunk there from uh, Uncle Harry. Original Atari, one of our original Atari joysticks. The uh, joystick top part is off of it. That's important. Those are the two main ones, the horn and the Atari joystick. So they're right there where the heart is, the main part. The all-seeing eye, I thought this was good because, you know, it's magnifying. It's looking at something with a different perspective. You know, I'm all about a different perspective. The original bat suit that I talked to you about took me 20 years to be able to do trades and to obtain it for free. Um, I just didn't, I never had money. Never, never, never moved towards riches and, and whatnot. I never had money. Most of these things that you see here were given to me, inherited, traded for. Like I did mention a few of the props that I, that I purchased, but then I uh, ended up uh, making more of them. Like, for instance, a holster, and here's a plastic gun, another one that I made, okay? Because some people wanted to do the Indiana Jones Last Crusade, a gun he used in that. So you, you help other people. I've got a shotgun from the mummy here. I bought the shotgun, sold it again, and made a mold, and was able to make a plastic gun for people. So that's very important, because I'm able to re-get the money back on the prop. So even the things that I paid for, I didn't necessarily pay for. Like for instance, this. This is a very nice old chandelier. My wife wanted it left in the house that we purchased and she's the negotiator. <laughs> I think it's better to have a negotiator that you don't think it's gonna be tough. Big, tall, strong guy like me with a big booming voice. You're a little, maybe a little intimidated, some girls are. I mean, anyway, these two, these two girls that were selling this house, uh, she negotiated it into the price of the house. So we have that there as a memory from our house. I have a fire grate also, it's still our fire grate today. These kinds of things don't cost us anything. They're all a matter of saying, I see some value in that. Let's see if we can make that a part of the deal. So that's one of the things. Horseshoes, every horseshoe I've ever found, a lot of them on our own land. Here's a cornet. When I was in fourth grade, this is a big story and here we're getting into uh, stories, but I guess I have to because the purpose isn't the thing, the purpose is the story. When I was in fourth grade, I wanted to get into the band. I wanted to learn how to be a musician. I started a little bit late. I guess I saw another guy that was a friend. He was in there and I said, oh, I want to do that. I came in, even though I practiced at night, I just didn't get good fast enough. And I thought our band leader was stern and an angry type of a person. And ultimately, it caused me to lose interest. I didn't want to lose interest. 
I just made that choice as a fourth grader. Well, on the day that I lost interest, and the last day I ever played with that band, it just so happened that we were given the Christmas play script. We were all given one copy, and we were told that every single person had to have a part in that play. Nobody was going to get out of it. You know, because people are shy, like me, an introvert, the artist type, behind the mask guy. Well, I was careful with it. I put it in my coronet case and went home. I lost my script. I forgot it was there. It was the last day I ever played the cornet. I put it in the bottom thing. I forgot I'd put it there. I lost my script. I did the one big thing you told us not to do. I lost my script. Well, it actually worked out good for me in more than one way. Number one, I didn't have to go up there and be a part. There were only a couple of good parts. The rest of the parts were just stupid things, but you were out in the front because the, the audience comes to see you. They want to see you. You know, they're mostly parents, right? I couldn't be there to memorize lines and do those basic things. But everybody, like she said, had to have a part. So what part did I get? They said, you can be the radio announcer voice from behind the curtain. And as long as you're back there and you need something to do for the rest of the time, you can be the stage manager. You can make sure that everybody has what they need, everybody's costume's correct, and everybody goes on and off when they're supposed to, things like that. Yeah, it wasn't really needed. I think the teachers did some of that stuff. But it made me feel like it was valuable. It made me be back there, feel like I still had a part, but made me feel like I was doing something. And that carried over. That carried over to entertainment. So the fact that I was in this music, why, this is not the one I had. I repurchased it for $100 because I wanted to re-go back in and learn how to play. And I did a little bit better than I was before. But why did I do that? I didn't do it because I wanted a cornet. I did it because I wanted to see what was I missing after that 45 years where the time went by. And I did it for my son. He was starting junior high school. And I felt that even though he's into exploration and animals, he needed something else in his life. He needed a multifaceted life. He could take something that will be good, that's been shown to many people to be good, and learn music. So I said, he was timid and shy. He didn't know anything. He was like me, an artist type, an introvert. But this changed everything. We supported him. We said, we're all going to sit down and learn together. I had a guitar, put it in my wife's hands, got him a saxophone, and I got this, and I let my little daughter bang away on the bells and the drums. And we sat there and studied in the book that he would study in school, and learned our instruments with him, so that we could be supportive to a foreign area that he wasn't a part of. And why was this so important? This was important because when we bought the house of the person that fell, I found a tape player. They left things there. They left things there that they should have never left. They took anything of value and left some of the most important things. I've got books and all kinds of other memorabilia from this lady, including a little tape deck. And the tape that was overlooked inside was the eulogy of the funeral for her husband. And this is how I found out by listening to it that he had opened his house to people that were the jazz greats of our time. When they came to play and service white America, they weren't welcome. So he opened the doors of his house to these people. He had a jazz show. He had a room full of thousands of records. I could have bought the records. I still have the bookshelves, but I didn't have the money to buy the records and I didn't know much about jazz. Like I'm saying, we decided to learn about jazz so that my son could learn about music, so he could be empowered by our support. So, I went and got this cornet saying, let's see what I missed 40 years ago, 45 years ago in fourth grade. Let's use that. So this isn't going to get sold. I could sell it. But this story, making my son's life what it's becoming, he did the work that we encouraged. The Lone Ranger said, famous quote, God gives us the firewood, but we need to decide that we're going to make the fire. You can take this to a Jesus teaching. The person with the one talent buried it in the ground. The person with the more talents did things with it. The master was pleased with those that did things. The master was not pleased by the person that buried it. 
So we resurrected this, we put it in a motion, we support it, and he took it to new high levels. He's played at the Hollywood Bowl twice. Now to me, that's the big thing because I always wanted to go to the Hollywood Bowl, I've only been there for him. But he is as good in my years as anybody. And he's just in college. He's done great things. But what's most important is not how good he is. He can stink. I used to tell him about when I went bowling on my bowling league when I was in fourth and fifth grade. I used to tell him about in junior high school how I used to be on the football team in PE that was the suckiest football team. And how much fun I have. I still love football to this day because of all the fun I had playing. Because when you're on a really good team, if you're not good, you don't get to have a good part. But when you're on a sucky team, you get to have every part. And that's what makes it fun. It's not winning. It's being a part of it. And that's what we did. He's a part of it. And that's what he does. He has a whole other split personality now. Different places he can go in life and live a different dual life. Just like me. I'm the behind the mask guy. I'm the physical realm guy. I'm the conscious counseling guy. I analyze. I think. I fathom. I look at things outside of our world. I work with things in our world. I'm aware of all the things that are surrounding me. And I use all those things to remember who I am, where I came from, why. Why is the biggest word. Not where, when, what, or how, but why. I can't prove anything that I talk about that's outer worldly exists. But I can prove that my belief and my analyzation of it produced positive results. So then I say, after all that, put the labeling on it if you choose to. Are those positive results from something beyond us and our implementation of it? I just choose to label that that's what God's doing. So I choose to believe God exists. You don't have to. But why not? It's something you can't explain. It's beyond you. All you see is what you're doing, what you've been able to accomplish. You don't see the rest of it, but I do, but I can't pick it up and say there it is like I can with all these things. I just can't do it. I'd like to be able to, but then all people would see. So the way we view things, Conscious Counseling 101, the perspective counseling that I offer, the way we view things, the way we value things, the way we care about what's in our life and what we do with it is the important thing. The rest of it's the labeling and your perception of what you think it might be. I go ahead and give credit that there's something bigger than myself making all this happen and call that God. I don't see any negative in it because I'm not judging anybody else or putting anybody else down. I put somebody else down if they don't have a large enough perspective to say it could be. The road to heightened intelligence is taking all things and looking at them closely and thinking about them, but not feeling like you have any pressure to implement them in your life, but that you may throw them away if you find there is no use to them, or that you hold something dear when a great discovery has come. And this isn't so much about stuff as it is process. So we're going to do a little section on the video about this. And you know, if the fire wipes this away, uh, you know, I don't play drums quite as much as I used to. All my thumb was in college with my roommates and things like that. But the skill development was important. But I want to talk not about the skill development, even though that's important because it helped me to develop my perspectives and my ability to be more than I would have been as just a shy introverted artist that didn't have skills and abilities over my hands and my rhythm and my techniques and my way to see complex rhythms and things like that in life and look for the patterns in life and see how that identifies with the music and the feeling and the emotion and, and the just the different overlays of textures and rhythms and, and things that so we can look at a, a larger, broader perspective and we can also look at lots of different perspectives like the little individual sounds and little different textures in, in the sounds. These things are in life. These things that we are given that have physicality to them that can help us to find other ways of understanding our world and the elements in it. But I want to talk to you today about how we got to where I had the things that I could work with that I needed. Because there's a few stories there and I'd like to focus on that. Let's start from the beginning, the very beginning. We already talked about the cornet, we talked about band, we talked about starting my son forward. But back in college, I rode the bicycle to the beach with my brother John and we would do things together and have a lot of fun making videos with my brothers and things like that but that was one of the activities we did. We rode 
to the beach on the bike. My brother David had a snare drum. He was going to be in the band at one point. And he just put it in the closet, never got used. One day we were dr we drug it out and we were playing the stereo and we we're seeing, can we keep the beat? You know, a lot of people can't keep the beat on the snare. My, my wife can't, for instance. I try to teach her to play the drums. But my, my brother and I both could. And so we just did that, put it away, had a little fun one day. We were riding our bike to the beach and we went by a folks music store in Sarasota and there was a little tiny drum set in the window. And, and I said, hey John, we got a snare drum if we just had these other drums, we could have all that kinds of fun like we were having, but we could do the whole drum set. <laughs> and so I went up to college that year and I found uh, three toms and a bass drum and a couple of cymbal stands and some tin cymbals. And I said to my mom and dad, hey, I could get these things for $100 to add to that snare drum that David's got. And John and I, when I come home for the summer, we can learn how to play drums. And we didn't have a lot of money, but they sent me the $100 and I got them. And I brought them home and spent that summer learning how to play drums. And it was another bonding thing I had with my brother we could do together. We could, we could, he was younger, so I didn't get to know him until later in life. But then finally he's up there. And we look at each other as about the same age when you get a little older. And we, we develop these things together. But I want to talk about the things themselves. Okay, so I took those drums after the summer back to college. Okay, and I set up in the basement that little set. And I was banging on these tin things and they just sounded awful. But it didn't matter because I was learning to play the drums. That's what mattered. But... How far can you go by yourself once you've learned your basic techniques? Probably not that far. All the people that I was surrounded by, including my roommate, was a really good saxophone player. I wanted to play with some other people. He did have a saxophone, but the, like the, the guy that I knew that wanted to play guitar, he didn't have a guitar. Well, we were on a summer trip, and we were at a flea market up in the Smoky Mountains, and there was this $100 guitar. And I thought, we learned how to play the drums. Maybe we can learn how to play music. I was wrong. It was a lot harder. But this country guy, he goes, yeah, that's a mighty fine guitar. <laughs> we just got such a kick out of it. It was a cheap ripoff, you know, not authentic guitar. Um, and, but my mom and dad went ahead and got it. It was, uh, I don't know, very inexpensive. And we started playing it. And I couldn't hardly play it, but I learned some chords and things like that. But the important thing was, I took that back to college with me. And it was sitting there. And so this guy that did know how to play the guitar, one of my friends, and this guy that did know music, how to play a saxophone, and my roommate, got together, we started playing. So the Mighty Fine Guitar helped form the first band. Now, once we started playing and he got better and he enjoyed it, he went and got his own guitar. He didn't need mine anymore. And I knew I wasn't gonna play the guitar. It wasn't my thing like drumming. So I sold that guitar and upgraded to something else that I needed. Like, I don't remember what it was. Maybe a bass or a couple of speakers or an amp or something. We kept working our way up every time. Back then, you could take an old drum set or something like that, or you could trade it for a cymbal stand or another drum set or whatever like that. And I kept doing this. And then one time, my grandmother, I had some electric drums. She got me an amp because you can't play the electric drums with the band because the other people can't hear them. Only you can in the headphones. And then that amp got traded for another drum set. And the, I traded in the electric drums for another drum set and then another drum set. And then finally, I was working with the uh, Baltimore Sun and the LA Times and Washington Post and different things and doing editorial illustration and got all those trades traded in and took money I was making I mentioned it earlier when I said maybe went to Africa. Well, she went to uh, Africa. It was either then I got this or, or maybe the Europe trip or something like that. And I said, I'm gonna take all my money that I have and buy a decent set of drums. So I did. But in this drum set is all the stages we went through. I never had enough money to buy anything right out. That mighty fine guitar is in here. That bass amp that my grandmother bought me is in here. The other drum set that I started out with with John is in here. Every single thing is in here. <laughs> so I finally took that stuff, kept trading up. You know, you heard that paper clip story, you can trade up for a Porsche one day. Well, that's basically what I did. I finally traded up for this. And, you know, I, I had a great time playing. I still can play anytime I want to. 
Um, but uh, the uh, idea is the thing itself is the facilitation of what you need to do, like video cameras. We're not going to go into video camera or all the costuming work that I do in this workshop today in this video. But we're going to talk about how the thing itself facilitates you, okay? Later on, we got this little jazz set. Uh, let me just talk about my 20th anniversary for a minute. I had a garage, and I was working on... Um, I was working on when things kind of hit a little bit after the towers fell and everything, things kind of slowed down a little bit. And we were working on, well, where can we find other things to do? And we, we, uh, we, uh, we renovated uh, a bungalow across the street that we were able to get a really good deal on. We didn't have hardly any money because it didn't seem like every time our timing was never right. Whenever we were holding something, uh, there was always like the towers fell or the 2008 collapse or whatever, right when we were holding it and nothing ever works. But um, we needed to go on our 20th anniversary, and what I did was I went and got the, all these drum sets on Craigslist and from the storage unit and stuff. I bought out a whole storage unit, and I lined my garage because my workshop at the time wasn't producing as much as it normally did because everybody was starting to feel the pinch because of the recession we went through after the towers fell. Well, I took all these drum sets, and I worked with them and renovated them and things like that, and made these tangible things and set each one up as an individual sale. So I'd come over, buy it, boom, there it is. And just keep doing that until the whole garage was cleared out. And then we were able to go on our 20th anniversary to Alaska. That's what I did. I did that for, I'd say almost a year. In addition to my home renovating and my costume creation, I also sold drums and things that I put together. So I had a whole bunch of things to go just so that we could go ahead and have the basic things that we didn't have money for, like that important 20th anniversary trip. The reason I bring that up is because then I took, you know, we talked about the jazz, um, the jazz house. I, I, one of the sets that I got was this one with the pearl on it. You know, it's really faded and everything. But this is a 1965 bass drum and tom, and that's the year I was born. So I thought, you know what? We're in the jazz house. I'm not going to get rid of that. This is going to be a legacy drum set that I keep for all my days as a jazz drum set, just like this was that I worked up to. So all that stuff that I did to get ready for our 20th anniversary, selling all those additional drum sets over and above, filling my garage where I could barely move, this came from that. One dark, thundering and lightning, rainy evening, I went and got that. And I looked, when I looked at that, and I said, oh, this is the perfect jazz drum set, and it was built the year I was born. I'm going to keep that. So here again, there's a thing. Now, this is the set that my daughter banged on when my son was learning to play the saxophone. I was revisiting the cornet, and my wife was working with the guitar, and we were trying to instill in him the confidence to go and try something new he had never tried and see if he could sell it, and he did. So this is that drum set once again here in the music room. And I have a piano here. Why? because I couldn't take to the guitar very well. Um, we got out of alignment on the studying of the cornet because he started going out of that book where we were all studying together and he had a new teacher and they were taking new directions. And I said, well, you know what? I can whistle like you wouldn't believe. I can carry a tune, no problem at all. This is one of the places where physicality didn't necessarily help me. I rationalized in my mind that if I could take and transfer what I can hear and do with my mouth to my fingers, I'd automatically be able to play the piano. And I was wrong. I couldn't do it. It just didn't come. There are limits to what putting a physical thing in front of you will do, you know? I'd sit there and I'd learn some of the basic chord. And some of the, I'd learn some of the fingering things. Oh, gosh, this needs to be dusted. I don't know, why don't you dust this sometime? <laughs> I learned some of the fingering things, but I couldn't keep up the pace with my children Max that was in school learning not only at home and practicing but also the things that they're learning from an actual teacher that knows how to teach and all the practice time they get there and when they took us out of that book and started going their own direction I couldn't keep up the physicality even though I put the physicality in my place I had to do my work every day I had to do all these other things I couldn't an old dog couldn't be taught a new trick even though I knew it'd get there eventually I'd never excel at it I couldn't get there fast enough to where this would be a part of my children's world. So I abandon it because they're moving on and I needed to work on things that I could do that would be 
more beneficial to our joint unity and harmony together. So that's just there. But it's there in a physicality world now that Anna picks this up and she has a song and she creates a song. She can't do very complex fingering or anything, but she can do the chords and she can sing while she's doing the chords and we've recorded a few songs. The main thing I brought us here was, there's Mr. Frangus. He's the, the man that uh, let Louis Armstrong, Hal Basie and all those jazz greats into his home of the house that we purchased that I found from the eulogy tape. And that's why he's there. There's Mr. Davis, my art teacher, one of the paintings that he did. That, he, that uh, when he died, I was, I was told that I could take uh, one of his works to remember him by. That's the one I chose. So that's really what this is about. The physicality of what went into this. 25 years of serious drumming. I'll never be a great drummer, but it made me a person that I wouldn't have been otherwise. The physicality of the actual physical thing helped me to enjoy the experience, to be fulfilled, and to move on and share it with my brother and others in bands I was in. I made it as far as where I actually played for the daughter of the blues, B.B. King's daughter. That was my final gig um, for that kind of a thing. And I got all the way to doing something like that. And I thought, geez, I'm just a regular person. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much my whole drum story. It, it changed my life in that like I said in the beginning, the perspectives that I can see and feel and be a part of and the worlds that I can open myself up to that I wouldn't have otherwise. And costuming the same way. Movies the same way. Working on the movies. Working here in LA around the Hollywood area. I'm exposed to things that I know what they mean. I know what they do. I've done it. I'm not actually doing anything here different than what I was doing in my other home on the other coast. But I'm aware of the things that happen here because of these things that I went through in my life and how they helped me to become more aware of it and more connected. So it boosts my, again, my, my overall sights and sounds and understanding and sensibilities and analytical things. It boosts it so that I'm in a presence of something where, where that, that, that I'm more aware of that, I'm more a part of that. I now know when I listen to a piece of music what it takes to make that piece of music. I kept up with Max for a good long time. He surpassed me. I can't hardly say anything, but that's great. Every once in a while I find something I can say, but he's just too good. Um, but I'm a part of that. I, I helped him, pushed him on to his way, and he did all the work. And he's become what he's become. My daughter's doing the same thing. She knows how to act. I try to guide her, uh, but you know she, she's always got another mind of how it should be. It's not the way that I think. But uh, one of the reasons I pushed her so hard was because she wanted to be a stage actress. She had this little tiny, 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 tiny little cartoon voice, which is the cutest thing you ever heard, but it doesn't work on the stage. So I think we butted heads a lot because everything I did for her was more about how you can be stronger and project more. Whereas if she was doing movies and film, I might have just said, well, just show your inflection a little bit more in a different way or whatever. Because with that, you're up close all the time and you, you want to be more sensitive and aware of everything that you're doing and not project so much. So, you know, um, it is what it is, guys. This is a little part of my world and there's physicality associated with it. Like I said, I went to my grandfather's shop, learned, saw him working with automobiles and different things. He made me a workbench one time and a little wooden car and different things like that. And I saw that you could make things with your hands and I wanted to get away from the drawing table because my father was on the drawing table and he was just a little too shy to suit me and everything that he was doing was just so sedentary. My grandfather, even though he died when I was very young, I saw what he did was much more all over the place, doing all kinds of things. I identified with that more. I wanted a life that was more, I guess the reason I wanted it is because I had so much time sitting at the drawing table doing what I felt was a lot, but still all the same type of thing. So I wanted to go and do other things. And so my life took me these different pathways. And I'm sharing this with you now because this is a, a video about the physicality of the things that I have done in my life. And the physicality of the things were necessary because I work with my hands, but the analytical analysis things that I did as an artist helped me to see the essence of what it was I worked with in the tangible, tangible realm, but I apply that to life. I apply that to Conscious Counseling 101, and I apply that to larger ideas that are governing us and controlling us and helping us to control from beyond, not just the physical realm. I believe and I identify with things that are outside of our world. Things we can only think might be there. By thinking that they might be there, this helps give us the idea that 
we're going to act as if they're there. Now this is the part you can, you can prove to another person. Because we act as if they're there, they become there because we act as if they're there, almost as if they're making us do that. We do it. We take it upon ourselves. I don't want to get into these things where we say, well, because of that, we create God. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going into those realms right now. What I'm saying is, the part you can hold up and show is, look, I've done these things. This is what I'm about. You can too. And I can help you to do it. If I apply a label to something that it's because there's a larger entity controlling it, that's just my label that I place on there. It's the highest thing I can come to. But even though I share that with you, I don't want to look down at you if you see it slightly different because I can't prove that I see what I see or know what I know. It's just how I'm experiencing it and I'm sharing that with you. But I can help you with vices. I can help you with difficulties. I can help you overcome obstacles. My life has touched on so many perspectives and different ways of viewing things and analyze things and growing from the things I've been through that Conscious Counseling 101 can help you with those things. That's why I'm doing these things. That's why this video exists. So you can see a portion of my world and how I view it and how it shaped me and how I keep it around me so that I can continue to draw from it, remember what I've gained, learn new lessons that I haven't learned yet and share all of that with anyone that wants to so that they can gain as well. That's what I'm all about in my life. That's the picture of the wholeness of what Paul is. What I do with it will be, well, again, a label. What does God send down the pike at me? What does God give to me to work with? I don't know, but whatever it is, that's what I'll work with. To whom much is given, much is expected. You know, I ex believe that I'm going to receive and I'm going to use what I use to the greater glory of the goodness that I have been given the gifts to work with something. It can go and hopefully help someone else in that capacity. So what am I? I'm a servant. I'm a student. When the student is ready, the master will appear. Well, where's my master? You're your master as well. You may learn from many, but you must learn that you know nothing. And you must learn that what you can know what you're surrounded by that you've experienced is your most valuable asset and you need to take that as far as you can and everything that you do you need to remember what that was and you need to go forward and be aware of every single thing that you go by as heightenedly consciously as you can and use those things as you are the master and those are your tools this is only one way conscious counseling 101 can share with you we can do it in many other ways, especially if you'll help and you'll get in there and chime in and help direct me a little bit as to what you'd like to see more of. This is Paul Roberts, Conscious Counseling 101.